All right, so um, now we're gonna go over the week 13 stuff. So this is like a continu continuation of like the fluids and materials that we started uh, in week 12. Uh, we'll quickly go through a review of some of the important concepts from last week. Um, so density again, mass over volume, right? Um, viscosity, um, we'll cover more in depth this time around. It's resistance to flow. Um, also, don't forget about the continuity equation, right? Q equals AV. And finally, Bernoulli's equation, which we use for um, moving fluids, dynamic fluids. Um, so viscosity, right? It's all about being a resistance to flow. So like fluids such as water, right? We can just pour and they'll easily flow so they are less viscous. Whereas if you think about honey, um, that's going to be more viscous because it's more resistance to flowing down the tube. Um, you don't need to know the fact that it depends on temperature. Um, just know like from this slide, I guess, know the definition of viscosity. If you think of it as resistance to flow, that should be more than sufficient. Um, so a new concept now that we'll talk about is the distinction between laminar and turbulent flow. So laminar flow is basically smooth and orderly. Turbulent flow is chaotic and rapid flow. So we look at this, uh, the smoke uh, evaporating, right? It begins as laminar flow. It's kind of smooth, steady, streamlined, and then it quickly shifts to turbulent flow where it goes w in whichever direction it wants to go in, right? So again, important takeaway, the distinction between laminar and turbulent flow, uh, that should be more than sufficient for here. So um, viscosity, like we said earlier, is resistance of flow. There's actually a way to quantify uh, whether something is undergoing laminar flow or if something is undergoing turbulent flow. And that's going to be a uh, Reynolds number. Um, let me pull, do you have the equation? The Reynolds number is yeah. uh, the density times uh, the length, I think. Hold on. Let me look, look, here, look on my computer. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why the equations didn't. Yeah, it's the, uh, it's the density times the length times the velocity divided by the viscosity. Okay, so uh, this equation, it's on the formula sheet, but it's imperative that you guys know what each of these variables means, right? So RE, that stands for Reynolds numbers. Uh, it's a way to quantify whether our, flu our flow is laminar or turbulent. This density term, this is the density of our fluid. L is not the length of the object, it's the length of our entire tube. So it's important to remember, sometimes they'll give you miscellaneous information with the length of the tube and the length of the object. It's important to remember that this L term in our Reynolds number equation is the length of the tube itself, not the length of the object. Additionally, we have this V, that's just the, uh, up, that's the fluid speed, right? Object speed? It's the object speed. Object speed, yeah. So V here, so this right here is the object speed. This viscosity term on the uh, denominator, eta, is going to be the viscosity of the fluid. And again, this is just simply the density of the fluid. Oh, wait, uh, so it's, yeah, it's not obviously it's the fluid speed fluid in speed. this case, but before it was the object speed. Yeah. So this should be fluid speed now. Sorry about that. No, 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 it's fine. fine. Yeah, so L right here, this is the length of the tube. So again, Reynolds number is equal to the density of the fluid times the length of the tube times the speed of the fluid divided by the viscosity of the fluid. Um, so again, uh, if our Reynolds number is less than 1,000, that indicates that it's going to be laminar flow. If our Reynolds number is greater than 4,000, right? I think it was, um, yes, yeah, less than 1,000 in laminar flow and greater than 4,000 yeah. is turbulent flow. Yeah. So again, Reynolds number less than 1,000 is going to be laminar flow. Reynolds number greater than 4,000 is going to be turbulent flow. If your Reynolds number is in between these two variables, it's going to be indeterminate. Like we can't tell whether it's laminar or turbulent. Um, so again, we simply, for any of these kinds of questions, you're usually given three of these four variables. You're asked to find the Reynolds number and you're asked to find whether it's laminar or turbulent flow. Um, I'm not sure if they specify on the formula sheet that this corresponds to laminar and this corresponds to turbulent. Uh, but if they don't, that's definitely a fair game for the exam as well. So. I believe they do indicate uh, those conditions, but if not, yeah, it's definitely something to memorize and definitely something to keep in mind. Plus, it just it's easier if you have it memorized because you don't have to flip through your equation for some piece of information like that. All right, so a uh, simple example, right? Basically, what they're saying is, just looking at the diagram, we don't even need to read all this text, right? We see steady streamlined flow to the left. We see a lot of chaotic flow, chaos to the right. 
Um, remember again, laminar is the steady fluid flow, steady um, streamlines, whereas turbulent is the chaoticness. Um, so our answer for this one is going to be A, right? Laminar to the left, where it's nice and smooth, and turbulent to the right, where it's a huge jumble. Any questions on, on actually, let's, let's go through one more, and then I'll pause for questions. So this, this is just a, two quick examples on simple types of multiple choice. The most simple you can possibly ask about Reynolds number, they simply want you to calculate the Reynolds number for these two cases. So here, right, for the first one, we're given the fluid speed of one meter per second. We're also given the river that's two meters deep. So again, think about a river as our tube. So the length of the tube in this case is going to be the two meters. And we're also told that we can ignore viscosity. So if we do this computation, right, um, we, know, uh, we know Reynolds number is equal to the density of the fluid times the length times the velocity divided by viscosity. Um, we know we're dealing with water, so the density of our fluid is going to be 1,000. Our length of our tube is going to be 2. And our uh, fluid speed is going to be 1. Um, note that our density of our fluid is in units of kilograms per meters cubed. Um, here the answer, they got 2 million because they did grams, I believe. They converted it to grams. Um, but because they say viscosity can be ignored, we don't have to worry about the denominator at all. Um, and so our answer for this is just going to be 1,000 times 2 times 1, so it's 2,000. Um, and Reynolds number is actually unitless. So you don't want to include any units with Reynolds number. Um, for this one, I think um, for some reason, it's, I downloaded the exact same slides, but they have the viscosity is one millipascal <laughs> seconds. Okay, okay. So if they told us um, the viscosity cannot be ignored as, and, and is instead one millipascal times seconds, um, note that now our viscosity is no longer in SI units, right? So we have to convert millipascals to pascals. And how we do that is we just go through our conversion factor, right? So millipascals to pascals is going to be uh, 10 to the negative 3, right? Yep. So remember, 1 millipascal is equal to 10 to the negative 3 pascals. So 1 millipascal seconds is the same as 10 to the negative 3 pascal seconds. So now that we have our new viscosity, we simply divide that because our viscosity is in the denominator. So we divide that by 10 to the negative 3. And hence, that's how we get the 2 million that they got here. Um, and again, no units because Reynolds number is unitless. So because this Reynolds number is greater than 4,000, that indicates that this is going to be turbulent flow. Um, looking at the second example, here we're, we have blood moving in a 0.2 millimeter diameter arterial at 3 millimeters per second. Um, so they, so if, if this question were given to you, they'd give you the density of blood, um, which is... 1,050. Okay, so the density of blood is 1,050 kilograms per meters cubed. Um, we're given the length of our tube as 0 0.22. We're also given the fluid flow, right? We're given the flow of blood as 3 millimeters per second. Um, the viscosity of blood, did they tell us that? Yeah, 3.5 millipascal seconds. I don't know why these values are not showing up. No worries. no worries. So they also tell us the viscosity of the blood is 3.5 millipascal seconds. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So now we basically have all four of our variables that we need um, in order to solve our Reynolds number equation. So the one thing that we just have to make sure we do is all of these are not in, so some of these are not in SI units, so we just want to make sure we're keeping everything consistent in SI units. Um, so density kilograms per meters cubed, that's SI units, so that checks out. So we do 1,050 times, next term is going to be our length of our tube. Note that our length of our tube is 0 0.2 millimeters, but again, that's not SI units. So we have to multiply that by 10 to the negative three, because we go from millimeters to meters to get SI units there. Um, and then we multiply that by the velocity term, so V. But again, they tell us the V is three millimeters per second. So, uh, same as before, we have to convert that to meters per second. So three millimeters per second is the same as three times 10 to the negative three meters per second. Then we divide all of that by the viscosity. Again, they give us the viscosity not in SI units, right? So they give us 3.5 millipascal seconds. We have to convert that 3.5 times 10 to the negative three pascal seconds. 
So now that everything's in SI units, we don't have to worry about the units no more. Again, Reynolds number is unitless. Um, and so we do this computation, pull out your calculator, plug in all the numbers, and you should get your Reynolds number to be 0.18. Um, and again, Reynolds number in this case is less than 1,000. That indicates that we're going to be dealing with laminar flow. Um, any questions on Reynolds number, laminar flow, turbulent flow? Those are the really three big takeaways from the first part here. None? Okay. Um, and then a quick, quick check here. Um, so here for an incompressible fluid flowing through a circular pipe, we know that the pipe narrows. Um, is the Reynolds number smaller or bigger after the narrowing compared to before? So two ways to approach this. Um, the one that I would recommend, just to make sure you're not making any mistakes conceptually, is to write out the equation for Reynolds number, right? So Reynolds number is equal to density of the fluid times length of the tube times the velocity of the fluid divided by viscosity. So if our pipe is narrowing, what's happening to the length of the tube? It's going down, exactly. So if our length of the tube is going down, then our Reynolds number is also going down. So we know that um, after the narrowing, our Reynolds number is going to be smaller. Wait, shouldn't it be? Yeah, viscosity is negligible in this case. Um, oh, you know what we have to do instead? We have to use the continuity equation. That's why. Um, so, okay, I see what we're, what we're doing here. So, you're right, the length of the tube is decreasing, but that's not the only variable that's being affected, right? Because our velocity is also going to be changing by virtue of the continuity equation. So if we set up Q equals AV, Note that this is the same as saying Q equals pi R squared times V. Um, again, that's just the area of a circular pipe. Um, we also know that our radius is half as big as it was before. If our radius is half as big as it was before, this term is going to be one fourth as big as it was before. Meaning that our velocity increases by a proportionality factor of four. So our velocity goes up by a factor of four because our flow rate has to be the same. Right? So let me restate that. Right, We're decreasing our radius by a factor of 2. Since we're squaring our radius term here, that means this entire term decreases by a factor of 4. In order to keep our flow rate constant, the other term here, velocity, has to increase by a factor of 4. So what in effect is happening is our velocity here is increasing by a factor of 4. However, our length here is decreasing by a factor of 2. So if our length is decreasing by a factor of 2, but this is increasing by a factor of four. Overall, this is increasing by a factor of two. And in essence, even though we're narrowing the pipe, our Reynolds number is going to increase by a factor of two. And so our Reynolds number is actually going to be bigger after the pipe narrows. So that's the first approach to think of it. The second approach is, you can imagine, if we're decreasing the size, size of the pipe, the fluid is going to just go in more and more chaos, right? It's just going to go in whatever direction it wants to go, the smaller and smaller we constrict it, right? Um, and um, that's characteristic of turbulent flow, which is correspondent with bigger Reynolds numbers. So that's another explanation for why the Reynolds number should be bigger after the pipe narrows. One thing that I would maybe edit, I'm not sure, yeah. but this is the pipe narrows. If the radius is the only thing that narrows, but like, shouldn't the length of the tube stay the same? Still, the Reynolds number would be bigger, but I think in that case, if they're just narrowing like the radius, basically, just narrowing the tube like that, and the length of the tube should remain the same, but... They look at the length from top to bottom. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, so if you have like a tube like this, I think you're... Oh. So if you have a tube like this, right, this is your length that we're looking at. That's the length of the tube. So, I don't know if they had a diagram to show that. No, probably not. But the length of the tube is that vertical length right there. Yeah, that's a good way to think about it. Yeah. So if we have water shooting out of a hose, we cover half of the hose, we're decreasing the, um, we're narrowing the pipe, therefore we're increasing um, the turbulence basically. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it's definitely important because I think he also explains that you have to take into account both the length as well as the velocity. You can't just do one or the other because students might tend to just, oh, half the radius so our length decreases by a factor of two so Reynolds number goes smaller yeah. but you also have to recall that velocity also changes 
based on the continuity equation. Any questions on this one? No, awesome. Um, so um, there's a lot of, um, of, so really the key takeaway from this slide is only this single point, right? The velocity is the same. So if we're, let's contrast an ideal fluid versus a non-ideal fluid. So in an ideal fluid, the velocity at any point is going to be the same. However, most fluids that we're going to be dealing with are going to be non-ideal, um, where the velocity at the walls, so as you go further and further away from the center, the velocity approaches zero, whereas the velocity directly at the center, that's going to be where it's at its peak. So really the key takeaway is the second bullet point right here. So near the fluid boundary, the flow will have zero velocity, while the, at the furthest point away from the boundary, so at the center of the tube, that's where velocity is going to be the highest. Again, this is only true for non-ideal fluids. So um, laminar flow, right, um, is, tends to be ideal fluids because it's smooth and orderly, whereas turbulent flow tends to be non-ideal. Um, so now let's take a look at um, resistance to flow. There's actually an equation, uh, not necessarily viscosity, um, but dealing with the pressure difference and how it relates to velocity. So the equation for this, I believe, is uh, delta P equals negative QR. So again, delta P is just our pressure difference. Um, again, this equation is only true for non-ideal fluids, which is the fluids that we're primarily going to be dealing with. Um, that's equal to negative times the flow rate times the resistance to flow. Um, as we'll see in a little bit here, there's another formula for the resistance to flow, um, which interrelates these two equations. Um, but again, this diagram, right, we covered pretty much pretty in depth uh, last week. I'll just quickly summarize it, right? At points three and four, area decreases. If area decreases, linear speed increases based on continuity equation. If linear speed increases, dynamic pressure increases. If dynamic pressure increases, static pressure decreases. If static pressure decreases, our height is smaller here. So that's like the TLDR for that diagram, basically. Um, so, so the static pressure is smaller at this point. It's not pressing up as much on the height there. So. Yeah. And if we recall, right, static pressure is the PA plus rho GHA, and then dynamic pressure is the rho VA squared. So again, if this term is smaller, that means the height at A is also going to be smaller here. Any questions on this one? Okay. Um, now let's look at Poiseuille's equation. So remember earlier I said delta P is equal to negative QR. So now Poiseuille's equation basically gives us our resistance flow, our R. So if I remember correctly, this is A times viscosity times length over pi R to the fourth. Is that correct? Yeah, and A times viscosity times length divided by pi R to the fourth. Awesome. So um, again, A is a constant. This eta term is going to be our viscosity of our fluid. This L is going to be the length of the tube. Um, this R is that radius of that tube. Um, so actually, I might have been mistaken earlier where L is the length of the, the horizontal length. So I might have been mistaken okay. on that. Um, so yeah, if we go back, we could scroll back to this one. So just for those who are going to be watching online, then the length here remains constant in this example. The radius changes and that causes the area to change if the area changes based on the continuity equation your velocity will change so if we see a decrease in the radius we see a decrease in the area therefore an increase in velocity right so if there's constriction there's an increase in the velocity the increase in the velocity alone would increase the reynolds number this length would just be the length of the two not you know the radius as well so reynolds number still increases for this problem it's just that it's only due to the velocity, not the uh, length of the tube. For some reason, I thought the professors explained that both are changed now. I might be wrong, though. Yeah, I thought, because this L is different than the other L, right? Because do you guys have this, this quick check? It depends on the situation. Yeah. Did you guys have this quick check in class? Like this example? A clicker question? Was this one of them, or? It was a quick question. Um, this was week 13, right? Yeah. Did they explain that? <laughs> okay, yeah. So they just looked at V as well. Um, 
So, just yeah, what you said yeah. is correct. Yeah, yeah. So, um, ignore, yeah. So ignore the length here. Um, um, that's how. That's the trick. That's the trick concept here. Um, but this pipe narrowing only affects the velocity by virtue of the continuity equation. It doesn't actually affect the length here because this LT is going to be our horizontal length right here. Um, okay. Um, so now let's look at um, Poisson's equation. So again, Poisson's equation tells us the resistance of flow. Resistance is equal to A times the viscosity of the fluid times the um, cross-sectional length, the, um, not the cross-sectional length, the horizontal length of the tube divided by pi times R to the fourth. Um, so again, most of the times it'll just be plug and chug or they'll give you a multiple choice question where if we increase one of these variables by X amount, what happens to the other, other variable assuming R is constant, something along those lines. So make sure you understand what each of these variables represents um, and you should be good to go for Poisson's equation. Um, another assumption, you can only use Poisson's equation for laminar flow. Um, you don't want to use it for turbulent flow. I think all of these equations are only true for laminar flow because they can be approximated to be an ideal fluid. Um, so um, yeah. Um, and then it's also important, right? Earlier we said that delta P is equal to negative QR. It's this resistance to flow that allows the fluid to actually flow. As counterintuitive as that sounds, right? The resistance to flow creates some sort of pressure difference between two separate regions in our tube. Fluids always flow from, flow from higher pressure to lower pressure, right? Um, think about diffusion, high concentration to low concentration. Same thing with fluids, right? It's going to be pushed from the higher pressure to the lower pressure. And that's all due to the actual resistance to flow in the opposite direction, basically. Um, so let's go through this example. So we're comparing blood flowing through bl two blood vessels. One is a artery with a diameter of, what's the diameter of the? 300 micrometers. 300 micrometers. And then the arterial? 30 micrometers. 30 micrometers, awesome. Um, and we're told that for blood at body temperature flowing through the same length, so we know the length is the same of the tube, um, how does the resistance of flow compare? So right away, you should be thinking, which equations have resistance in them? So let's write out the two equations, right? Delta P is equal to negative QR. We also know resistance is equal to H times uh, viscosity times length over pi R to the fourth. So right away, we should be asking ourselves, we're told the diameters of both of these. We're also um, told the length of these tubes. So we should be not even thinking about the first equation because we're not told anything about the flow rate or any sort of pressure difference that's occurring here. So let's cross out the first equation. Let's now only look at the second equation. So R is equal to eight viscosity length over pi R to the fourth. And we look at, we quickly take a scan of our answer choices. We're asked to compare the resistance for the art artery and the arterial. Um, well, how we do this, right, is if we want to compare any differences, we only have to look at what's different. We can ignore anything that's the same for both the artery and the arterial. So right away, we see both of them have an eight. We can cross that out. Let's not even worry about it. They both have a pi. Let's not worry about it. Do they both have the same viscosity? Yes, right, because they don't tell us anything about any differences in viscosity. So again, don't worry about it. Do they have the same length? Again, yes, right? We're told that they both flow through the same length of a three centimeter tube. So again, remember, this L corresponds to the length of the tube that it's flowing through, not the length of the actual fluid itself, if that makes sense. So again, they have the same length, so we can get rid of that. However, note that they have different radius, right? They, one has a diameter of 30, one has a diameter of 300. So what this uh, Poisson's equation basically boils down to now is R is equal to one over R to the fourth. So note, we went from the super complicated equation to this simple, Terminal to this simple relationship between resistance to flow and radius. Now the next thing we want to do is compare the thing that's different, which is the radius for both of them. So we know if the diameter is 300 micrometers, the radius is 150. Here, if the diameter is 30, the radius is 15. So 15 and 150, they're kind of messy numbers to work with, right? Nobody wants to take either of those to the fourth power. What we should instead do is look at how big of a factor that difference is. So this is 15 micrometers, this is 150 micrometers. So another way of saying this is the artery has a 10x radius relative to the arterial. 
So our artery um, has a 10 times as big radius compared to the arterial. So if the artery has a 10 times as big radius, let's say the arterial simply has a radius of one. Let's work with simple numbers, right? If arterial has a radius of one, so arterial radius of one, that means the resistance is one over one to the fourth, which is simply one. Now, our artery has to have a radius of 10 because it's 10 times as big as the arterial. So if our artery has a radius of 10, our resistance is one over 10 to the fourth, which is one over um, 10,000, right? Because four zeros. So now we know our artery has a resistance of one over 10,000, our arterial has a resistance of one. So now we just look at our answer choices and we see that the arterial is 10,000 times as big as the artery resistance. So we mark A and we keep on moving. So I kind of laid this out pretty detailed, but um, do what works best for you. Um, if you work better at just setting it up like an equation, like RA is equal to 10 RB, um, and going that way, feel free to do that. Um, this is just what works best for me, um, but there's definitely more than one way to approach these kinds of problems. Um, any questions on this one? Awesome. So um, um, this, these three bullet points are important in terms of really understanding the relationship between different variables in Poisson's equation. So if we write out Poisson's equation again, right? We know resistance is directly proportional to viscosity. So as viscosity goes up, resistance goes up. If length of the tube goes up, resistance also goes up. However, if radius decreases, we're decreasing our denominator, which leads to an increase in resistance, right? Because if our denominator is smaller, that increases our overall fraction. So those are the three ways that we can increase our resistance. Um, so yeah. Um, but I'd say as long as you understand this equation, it should be pretty simple, straightforward to go um, do the different manipulations between the different variables. Um, this one we don't need to know. Um, so the circulatory system, you might get an example, like using the circulatory system as an example, as, as like the foundation of a question. You don't necessarily need to know any of the details of the circulatory system, uh, but you do need to be prepared. Like for example, this example, right? It's in the context of the circulatory system. So let's go through this example, right? We know the heart is pumping blood at five liters per minute. So can someone tell me if this is, a, like what variable does this correspond to? Five liters per minute. Uh, not the velocity. Flow rate. Um, so remember, velocity is always distance over time, right? Um, so like meters per second or something like that. Um, remember that flow rate units is basically volume over time. So this is flow rate, whereas velocity is distance over time. So oftentimes, they won't tell you whether they're talking about flow rate or velocity. They'll just give you the units and ask you to determine which one it is, right? So here, liters is a measure of volume. Minutes is a measure of time. So we're dealing with flow rate. So we know Q is equal to five liters per minute. Um, and I believe they give the SI unit conversion. If the flow rate will be 8.3 times 10 to the negative meters cubed per second. Um, and obviously they didn't have to be that generous, right? They could have just given you the five liters per minute and asked you to, or tested you on whether you knew how to convert it. Um, so those conversions are on the formula sheet. You should know minutes to seconds, um, and then liters to meters cubed is also on the formula sheet. Um, but you al always want to make sure you're working with SI units when doing these kinds of problems. Um, so we know, we know flow rate. We're also told that the average blood pressure drop, so again, that's delta P. A pressure, delta P stands for pressure drop, is going to be um, 100 millimeters of mercury, um, which again, millimeters of mercury is not SI units. So they give you the conversion on the formula sheet as well. Uh, but for sake of time, it is 13.15 kilopascals, so uh, okay. 13,000 yeah. pascals. Awesome, yeah. So again, kilopascals, again, not SI units, right? Pascals is the SI units, so we just have to multiply this by 10 to the 3 to get our delta P in uh, units of um, pascals, which is SI units. And they're basically asking us, what is the resistance of flow, right? So this should be a simple plug and chug into delta P equals negative QR. Um, 
you'll note that your flow rate is never going to be negative and your resistance is also never going to be negative. So these two are always positive. And so this is where you kind of want to read the question a little bit carefully because your delta P can, delta P always has to be negative, but that's because they're talking about a pressure difference. Technically, delta P simply stands for a pressure drop. So in this case, even though they tell you the pressure drop is 13.15 times 10 to the three Pascals, it's technically negative 13.15 times it's 10. The average blood pressure uh, drop, right? So yeah. they're talking about blood pressure drop. That pressure difference is going to be a decrease in pressure. Yep. Um, and so we know the delta P, negative 13.15 times 10 to 3 Pascals, is equal to negative Q, which we know as 8.3 times 10 to the negative 5 milliliter, meters cubed per second times resistance. The unit should cancel out if we did everything in SI units, so we don't have to worry about the units. Um, and then we get our answer for resistance to be... The resistance is 1.5 times 10 to the 8 Pascal seconds per meter cubed. Yeah, so um, how we get those units for resistance, right? We're simply doing Pascals on the left divided by meters cubed per second. So technically we're doing Pascals divided by meters cubed per second. And if we're dividing something, we can multiply by the inverse of it. So this is the same thing as doing Pascal times seconds over meters cubed. And that's how we get the units right here. Um, so they do take off points if you don't include the units when units are necessary. Um, so just make sure you're keeping tabs on that. Any questions on this problem? No? Okay. <clears throat> um, yeah, and again, um, be able to do the conversions above it has, right? Um, so let's go through this example as well. So we have a typical capillary has a length of one millimeter. So I just like to write out the variables as we go, so I'm keeping track of everything, right? So one millimeter, again, not SI units, so let's go ahead and do that quick conversion. So that's going to be 10 to the negative three meters. We're also told that the radius... Uh, the radius is five micrometers five micrometers. Um, sorry about the numbers cutting off on the slides, but um, if you look at your copy of the lecture slides, you should have the numbers. Um, so five micrometers, so again, let's convert that to SI units, so five to times 10 to the negative six meters. Um, we're also told the viscosity. It's five millipascal seconds. Five millipascal times seconds. Again, not SI units, so let's go ahead and convert that to pascal seconds. So that's gonna be five times 10 to the negative three pascal seconds. We also are told that the heart is pumping blood at five liters per minute. So we did that conversion up above. The five liters per minute corresponds to 8.3 times 10 to the negative five uh, meters cubed per second. Um, and this blood is split roughly through about one billion different capillaries. So we're dealing with one billion capillaries. <clears throat> we're asked to compute the pressure drop across a typical capillary in units of kilopascal. So Several things to know here, right? First of all, the question is asking us to find the pressure drop of only a single capillary. So if we recall our equation for pressure drop, we know it's delta P equals negative QR. But this delta P, if we use this flow rate, that tells us the pressure drop across one billion capillaries, right? So we only want to find it across a single capillary. And so what we have to do is we have to now find the flow rate across a single capillary. Um, and I believe that's why we have to do 8.3 times 10 to the negative 5 divided by 1 billion. Exactly. Yeah. That's, you get 8.3 times 10 to the negative 14 meters cubed per second. 8.3. Yep. So again, we take the flow rate, we divide it by 10 to the 9, which is a billion. And this number, 8.3 times 10 to the negative 14, tells us the flow rate across a single capillary one of those one billion capillaries. This is the flow rate of one of those capillaries. So now we solve for Q. So the only thing that's left is to solve for R. So how do we solve for R? Well, we use Poisson's equation. So R is equal to eight times viscosity times length um, over pi R to the fourth. So again, we plug in all of our variables. We already converted everything to SI units, so it should just be plug and chug now, right? So eight times our viscosity, which is five times 10 to the negative three times our length, which is 10 to the negative three, uh, divided by pi r to the fourth, so pi times r, they tell us our radius is five times 10 to the negative six. We take that to the fourth power, 
And we get our value for resistance. Two times 10 to the 16th. Two times 10 to the 16th. Um, and again, resistance is going to have units of Pascal times seconds over meters cubed. So now that we have that resistance, right, we can simply go back and plug that in into delta P equals negative QR. So delta P is equal to negative Q, which is our flow rate for an individual capillary. So 8.3 times 10 to the negative 14 meters cubed per second times our resistance, which is 2 times 10 to the 16 Pascal seconds over meters cubed. You'll note that the meters cubed over seconds cancels out with the seconds over meters cubed, and that leaves us our final answer to be 1660 Pascals. 1660 Pascals. But again, don't forget the. So technically, there would, should be a negative sign, but again, that negative sign is only indicating that the pressure is decreasing. Um, here, since they're only asking us for the pressure drop, we leave it as a positive number because the pressure drop tells us how much the pressure is dropping. So if we, if we answer this by saying negative 100, we're saying that the pressure is increasing by 100 because the drop is negative 100. Because it could be like saying, like, I dropped negative 1660. When if you just say, I dropped 1660, it means negative, obviously. So yes. it would be redundant to say negative 1660 drop. Yeah, so your pressure <laughs> drop is always going to be a positive number as your answer. However, in your computations, it has to be a negative number. Um, I don't think they'll take off points if you yeah. write negative or positive in the computations, but that's basically how this negative sign cancels out here. Um, because otherwise we'll be left with the negative number there. Like pressure difference, you need it as like pressure difference, but you need to drop to add a negative sign. Yeah. Cancel out, or that not no, I wouldn't throw in an extra negative no. sign. So I would just solve it as is with the equation. And then no. if it happens to be a drop, right, then you can say like the pressure drop by 1665 gallons. You can drive that like that. Uh, but if you throw in an extra negative sign, then it'll just, everything will be kind of flipped. Right, so if you left your answer as this, you'd still get one point off because they want the answer in units of kilopascals. So don't forget to do that yeah. last step here. So 1.66 mm -hmm. kilopascals. Again, it's not going to be a negative number because they're asking us for a pressure drop. So the pressure drop is going to be 1.66 kilopascals. Any questions on this one? I know it's a pretty involved example here. Okay, let's keep on going. Um, so um, this slide you don't need to know, this you don't need to know. Um, so this one I will quickly go through. Um, it's, it's similar to what we just talked about. Um, it in introduces a concept that we talked about in like week one. Um, but we're told that a capillary has a length of one millimeter, so length of one millimeter, convert that to SI units to get 10 to the negative three meters. We're also told that the total cross-sectional area is... 0.4 meters squared. 0.4 meters squared and the radius of an individual capillary, five micrometers. micrometers. So again, um, um, uh, so meter squared is SI units, this five micrometers, we have to convert it to five times 10 to the negative six meters, so that's our radius of an individual capillary. We're also told that the heart is pumping blood at five liters per minute, so that in SI units is the same number as before, 8.3 times 10 to the negative five. Again, that's meters cubed per second. Um, and how much time does it take for a red blood cell to move through a capillary? So now they're looking for time. Well, we might be stumped, right? Because none of our fluid equations have time in them. So now what we have to do is using what we know so far, we know flow rate, we know Q, we also know area. So right away, you should be thinking continuity equation. So we do Q equals AV, so 8.3, times 10 to the negative 5 is equal to 0 0.4 times V. We do that division to get V as... V is 0.21 and millimeters per second. 0.21 millimeters per second? Yeah, that's how they okay. calculated it. But so uh, let me put that down here. So if you did this uh, just using this, you, you should get um, 210. Uh, meters per second. Let me double check this to be sure because I think this might be a typo. But okay. It's a, it looks right though. 8.3 divided by 0 0.4. I think it's right. Yeah, I think that's right. Or, sorry, not 210 meters per second. 
two. Sorry, two point one times ten to the negative five meters per second. There we go. Um. Right. It's point zero 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 two. Sorry, one. twenty one times ten to the negative five. Two point one times. Two point one times seven to the negative four. Yeah. Which, yeah, I guess if they, that's meters per second. Yeah. So they, I think they just convert it to millimeters per second just to keep things easy. Yeah. So, um, again, uh, I don't have my calculator with me, but just plug in and chug that, right? 8.3 times 10 to negative 5 divided by 0 0.4. That gets you your velocity as 2.1 times 10 to negative 4 meters per second. Um, and then um, they, for some reason, decided to convert that to millimeters per second. Um, I think it's because their calculator has a length of 1 millimeter. So <laughs> oh, okay. when you get to this next step here. Yeah. So um, I'll do it with SI units just for convenience because yeah. we already converted our length to SI units. Mm -hmm. um, but now that we have velocity, right? Remember the equation that relates velocity and time. V is equal to delta x over t, where delta x is simply our displacement or our length in this case. So we set velocity, which is 2.1 times 10 to the negative 4. Again, that's meters per second. That's equal to our length, which we know is 10 to the negative 3 meters, divided by time in seconds. Um, we do this computation and we get time to be 4.8 seconds. 4.8 seconds. I think a good way to approach this problem as well is that if you think about, because you, you might not be sure that you're looking for like velocity as you're going to kind of use at the end. So if you go back to the problem, it says how much time does it take for a red blood cell to move through a capillary? So you're looking at time it takes to cover a certain distance. Time it takes to cover a certain distance distance over time, right? So that's how you can kind of unlock that specific equation to figure out that you're using velocity that relationship x over t to kind of use that at the end. Um, but initially, obviously, you have those area values, so you use that continuity equation q equals a b to then figure out um, what your velocity is, and then from the velocity, right, um, you can use that x over t to multiply over the t, divide over the velocity, and get your um, or your time. Yep. Uh, this slide we can skip. This it's just background on the circulatory system. You don't need to know any of it. Um, like you might get a multiple choice question like this. Like this is a common example, right? Um, so um, I think this is simply just a plug and chug of Reynolds number. Mm -hmm. um, so I won't go through this example specifically, but again, you're given the diameter um, as some number. You're given the flow as Q uh, as some number. You're also given the viscosity and the density of the fluid. So you simply just, um, what's the equation again? Eight. Yeah, it's eight times, um, the viscosity times length times pi or r to the fourth. Reynolds number or? That's r resistance, right? right? Oh shoot, is it my Reynolds number? Yeah, so that, this would be um, density times length times velocity divided by viscosity. Yeah. So um, you're given all four of these variables, basically. So you simply just solve for Reynolds number. Um, and um, if it's less than 1,000, it's laminar. If it's greater than 4,000, it's turbulent. If it's in the middle, it's hard to say. Um, any questions on this one? OK. Um, so surface tension, um, it's, I don't believe it's necessary to understand on a conceptual level. You simply need to understand the equation that surface tension is uh, relating to. Uh, which is going to be, I believe, lambda is equal to magnitude of your tension force divided by the length over which that tension force is applying. So um, the easiest way to do this would be to do an example. Um, so um, this is the correct equation, right? Yep. OK. Um, note that our surface tension is always going to be positive um, because our numerator is a magnitude. That's always positive. Our length is always positive uh, by virtue of being a distance, right? So. Here we have a thin film of liquid soap. Um, we're moving the sliding wire um, to the right one centimeter, and the soap stretches with it. Um, we also know that an external force does how much of work? 20 microjoules. 20 microjoules of work. Um, dragging the wires to the right at constant speed. Ignore any friction of the sliding wires. Determine the surface tension of the soap. So right away, you might think, well, we're, we're not really given a tension force and we're not really given a length in the problem itself. So what we have to do is we have to go back to 
um, I hate to say free body diagrams, but that's essentially what it is. Um, you don't, as long as you understand that we're dealing at, with constant speed, which means that there's no acceleration. If there's no acceleration, there's no net force. So what that means is that this force that's doing this work, dragging it to the right, is counteracted by some equal and opposite force going to the left. Well, this is our pulling force, and the only force that can counteract that is going to be our tension force. So, how do we calculate our pulling force? Well, we'd have to do uh, work. Remember, our equation for work is going to be the work is equal to the magnitude of our force times the distance over which that force is applied times um, cosine theta, where theta is the angle between the force vector and the direction of movement. So here, our magnitude of our force we're not given, that's what we're trying to find. We're, we are told that we have 20 microjoules of work, let's convert that to SI units. So 20 times 10 to the negative six joules is equal to, I'll just write F for force, times the distance over which that force is applied. They say that that distance is one centimeter, but you don't want to plug in one here, you want to plug it in as an SI units. So it's going to be one times 10 to the negative two, which is just 10 to the negative two meters, times cosine theta. Well, theta, remember, is the angle between the force vector, which is directly to the right, and the angle of our displacement, which is also directly to the right. So the angle between these is zero degrees, right? They're pointing in the same direction. There's no angle between those two vectors. If there's no angle, we have this term being cosine of zero. Well, what is cosine of zero? That's just one. So this is just times one. And so all we have to do is we have to do 20 times 10 to the negative six, Divide that by 10 to the negative 2. That gets us our magnitude of our force here. Um, and we get our magnitude of our force to be 20 times 10 to the negative 4, right? Yeah, 1002 newtons. Yep, so 20 times 10 to the negative 4 newtons. Note, this is the magnitude of our, yeah, question? Oh, okay. So yeah, this is the magnitude of our pulling force. This is equal and opposite to our tension force. Now, our tension force technically is negative 20 times 10 to the negative four. So FT without a magnitude is negative 20 times 10 to the negative four because it has to be equal and opposite by virtue of this constant speed. However, in our formula for surface tension, we have to plug in the magnitude in our numerator. So we set surface tension, which is this variable lambda, um, that's equal to 20 times 10 to the negative four divided by the length. Yeah. The only thing is that you have two sides. So technically the surface tension, or the, um, the tension force would just be the one side. So it'd be half that at 0 0.001. Oh, are they? Because there's two surface tensions and you're only wanting to find um, just one force of tension, not both of them together. Oh, okay. So we have to divide by two? Yeah. So you just divide the 20 times 10 to the negative four by oh. two to get only one force of tension. I see, yeah. So since this tension force is applying um, this way, it's equal, an equal amount of that tension force is applying here, an equal amount of that tension force is applying there. So remember the surface tension is the interaction between a fluid and the surface that it's on. So in this case, we have to divide this tension force by two to get the tension force is basically being 10 times 10 to the negative four. So let me erase that right here. Essentially what it is, it's a fiddle of fluid, right? So imagine you have like a bubble, right? If you like blow a bubble, there's obviously there's, I don't know what you call it, the little thing, magic wand, whatever, right? So um, on both sides, you have kind of the liquid or the fluid. And so the force of tension, that would be the 20 times 10 negative four when you factor in both sides. But since you kind of have those both sides, both gateways there, you would divide by two because you want the tension just in general, like for one side of the fiddle and one side of the fluid. So that's why you have to divide by two. Yep, and then uh, once we do that, then we have to divide that by the length. So this length is going to be the cross-sectional length. I don't know if they had a good diagram to explain it, but it's basically the length, um, think about it as over what's the entirety of this tension force is being applied on. Um, so in that case, that's going to be two times 10 to negative three. And so our answer for this should be five times 10 to the negative one. What's that? Mm -hmm. They have, I think they have two, but I think they might have, yeah, because oh, yeah, the yeah. length was two centimeters. Sorry about that. So this yeah. should be two times 10 to the negative two meters. 
I can't do math either today. Um, and then, then that equals five times ten to the negative two yeah. as our surface tension, which is um, newtons per meter. Newton per meter. Yep. Any questions on that one? Awesome. Um, this is just explaining that. Um, if you wanted to draw a free body diagram, you're more than welcome to. Um, and then this is if you want to do it using um, a different concept related to energy. I won't go through this one because this, for, for the sake of this chapter, it's really relevant, this surface tension formula. So you don't need to do it in more than one way, if that makes sense. Um, the next big topic is the difference between cohesion and adhesion. So um, think about cohesion as like coming together, right? C goes with C's, right? So cohesion is basically coming together. So cohesive forces are basically molecules with themselves. They, co they form a cohesive surface. Adhesion, on the other hand, is going to be molecules with other substances. So they adhere to a different surface, right? So you can think of this as like a sticky tap or something, some sort of adhesive it sticks one surface to another surface, right? So adhesion is between different molecules. Cohesion is between the same exact molecules. Um, so that brings us to a Laplace equation, which basically, I believe, relates the adhesive surface tension to the regular surface tension. It's going to be lambda sub A, which stands for adhesive surface tension, is equal to regular surface tension. Um, that's, uh, one, but that's that one? Equations, the pressure inside Oh, yeah, yeah. equal to the pressure outside plus two times the surface tension divided by the radius of curvature. Oh, yeah. I was getting ahead of myself there. Um, so this is the Laplace equation. So whenever we form some sort of bubble or some sort of like meniscus, right, there's going to be an inside and there's going to be an outside. We can relate the pressures of those two regions through this equation. P in equals P out plus two lambda over RC. Lambda, again, is our surface tension. RC is our radius of curvature, or the hypothetical sphere that would be formed if our interface were, was a complete sphere. So let's say they just gave you a meniscus like this. Now, they ask you to use the Laplace equation, right? So what you want to do is you want to draw a hypothetical circle, a hypothetical sphere. From here to the center of there, that's going to be our radius of curvature. The easiest way to distinguish in versus out for me is P in is always inside the circle, P out is the other region. So that's always going to be the whole true, that's always going to be the case. So if we're just looking at a meniscus, right? And if you get really good at drawing the circles, get really good at into, into internalizing it, you can immediately recognize this is going to be your P in, this is going to be your P out. Note that for this example, we're dealing with the meniscus facing the other way. So if we draw our hypothetical circle again, that's a really bad circle, but P in, again, is going to be on the inside of that circle. P out is on the exterior of that circle. Um, and then again, our radius of curvature is from the center point of that circle to the exterior. Um, um, this equation, um, which one did they have on here? Is it R over RC? Or is it the same one? No, it's not the same one, but it's... Yeah, I think it's like the R over RC. Yeah, the radius divided by the radius of curvature, like the yeah, cross-sectional yeah. radius divided by the radius of curvature is equal to cosine theta C. That one? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. So note that we, we already know what radius is. Radius is just the radius of the meniscus. That's different from the radius of the curvature, which is the radius of the actual bubble or interface being formed. Um, those two are related via this cosine theta C. Now, Oftentimes in a diagram, they'll label theta C for you, but think about theta C as the contact angle, which is the angle that our fluid makes with the surface. So um, they'll almost always like tell you or show you in the diagram where exactly they're referring to, but this is just a simple equation that relates R to RC. The contact angle would basically be kind of, if you want to draw it as well on the iPad, but yeah. it's like this right here. That would be your theta. So just imagine it's like where the water is and then where's the boundary of the fluid or the tube. So that would be the contact angle right here. And at the same time, like, I guess it's not really needed, but by geometry, like if you were to draw, this is your little R right here, which is the um, cross-sectional radius. And so this angle right here 
there's like different geometric rules, but apparently this this angle right here is equal to the contact angle as well. So they will give you like both kind of uh, ways to look at it. If they don't give you this angle right here and they just give you this one, know that it's the same contact angle. But they usually label both of them. Yeah, they usually I'm label exactly all the, exactly even, I, I doubt that they'll have you like look at the diagram or figure things out like that. They'll just tell you what the contact angle is from yeah. the beginning. Awesome. Um, you don't really need to know the difference between droplets, bubbles, and cavities. Um, but this is definitely like a fair game type of multiple choice question. Definitely on the easier side here um, in terms of what they ask. Um, we have a spherical raindrop that's surrounded by air. Is the pressure inside the raindrop greater than, less than, or equal to atmospheric pressure? So let's just draw a half of, or let's just draw a half of a raindrop, right? Um, so remember, on the inside of our circle, that's going to be P in. On the outside, that's P out. So remember, our equation is P in is equal to P out plus, which, what's the second term? Yeah, uh, plus 2 times the surface tension divided by the radius of curvature. Yeah, plus 2 times the surface tension divided by the radius of curvature. So, right away we know P out is uh, 1 atmosphere. We also know this surface tension always has to be positive. This radius of curvature always has to be positive. So what we're essentially doing is we're taking a number and we're adding some positive el element to it. And obviously that's going to cause this to increase, right? Because if we treat this as like 10 and we add like 5 to it, P in is going to be greater than P out. Um, and again, that's due solely to the uh, Laplace equation. Um, any questions on that? None? Okay. The only thing, yeah, so I would go back slightly to the uh, whole like droplet cavity. The whole yeah. thing, the only thing I noticed was that, so that bubbles have two surfaces, so you must use Laplace equation twice. So, yeah. I'd say like maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we'll go through one example with bubbles, but they have like this internal region. Sorry, they have this internal region, and they also have this external region. So you have to use Laplace for this interface as well as for this interface. So you have to basically do it twice. Um. So um. Let's go through this example really quickly. So we're given the surface tension as 50 million, million newtons per meters. So let's go ahead and convert that to newtons per meters. So 50 times 10 to the negative three newtons over meters. We also know that she's blowing a large bubble. We're given the radius of two centimeters, which is 0 0.02 meters. And we're asked to find the gauge pressure in the bubble. So instead of directly going to gauge pressure, let's first start with atmospheric pressure. So we know that the soap bubble has an inner and an outer surface. Both of effectively the same radius. So this is what uh, Mustafa was saying earlier with bubbles and having two surfaces, right? So there's this interface here, but there's also this interface that we have to consider right here. So let's first look at the intersection between this inside part and this surface right here. So we know uh, P in is equal to P out plus two times lambda over RC. So, um, Let's treat this internal point as A, this point as B, and this exter external point as C. So if we write out our sets of equations, we know PA is equal to PB plus two times the surface tension over RC. We also know PB is equal to PC plus two times lambda over RC. Um, we know PC is going to be 10 to the five uh, Pascals, because that's our atmospheric pressure, that's on the external point. So plugging that into our second equation, we get PB is equal to 10 to the 5 Pascals plus 2 times our surface tension, which we're given as 50 times 10 to the negative 3, divided by our radius of curvature, which we're told is 0 0.02. And so we solve for PB, and we get some number um, for PB. Um, and we want to do that basically, again, I won't go through the math here, but once we get that PB value, we plug that PB into here, same surface tension, same radius of curvature, and we get a new value for PA. Now, once we get that value for PA, remember, this is the absolute pressure. In order to find gauge pressure, we have to find the difference between atmospheric pressure and this pressure. So let's say PA is like, 111,000, 
then our gauge pressure is going to be the difference of these two pressures, right? So it's going to be 111,000 minus 100,000, which is our atmospheric pressure, and this is equal to 11,000. So again, note that these are just hypothetical numbers, but what you want to do is actually go through the computations and solve for PV first. Once you solve for PV, plug that back into the first Laplace equation to solve for PA. Once you solve for PA, convert PA absolute pressure to PA gauge pressure. Any questions on that one? No? Okay. Um, so, um, I won't go through this review that much in depth because um, we just covered it. They're also available in the recording as well. Um, this is all a review, Laplace equation. Um, let's go through this quick check. Uh, this is a new type of problem, slide 59. Um, so here, right, we're given two uh, balloons, right? We're asked to identify which way the air will flow. So remember, the air always flows by virtue of a pressure difference from high pressure to low pressure. So both of these equations can be set up via Laplace equation. So P or PN equals P out plus two lambda over RC. Here PN equals P out plus two lambda over RC. <coughs> so right away, right, lambda is the same for both of them. The surface tensions are the same. Um, I believe they tell us that, assume the surface tension is constant. We also know P out is the same for both of them because they're both in the atmosphere. They're both exposed to the air. So if P out is the same, we can get rid of that. Lambda is the same, we can get rid of that. Two is the same because it's a constant, we get rid of that. So the only thing that's different is RC. We see that the bigger balloon, this bigger bubble, sorry, has a bigger radius of curvature. By virtue of having a bigger radius of curvature, it's going to have a smaller internal pressure, right? Because this basically boils down to PN equals one over RC. Bigger radius of curvature means smaller internal pressure. So let's say this is like one Pascal. Here, since the radius is smaller, that's going to correspond to a bigger inside pressure. So here, let's say PN is like two Pascals. We know fluids flow from high pressure to low pressure. So this is going to flow from the two pressure to the one pressure. So it's going to flow from the small balloon to the large balloon here. Any questions on that? Okay. Just a few more small concepts here. Um, I know we're getting tired, but hang in there for like five more minutes. Um, we can skip this slide. We can skip this slide. We can also skip this slide. Um, this slide, um, is it, what's the equation yeah, that they have here? Like, it's like, yeah, you said that before, the adhesive uh, surface tension is equal to the surface okay. tension times one plus cosine. Theta C. Yeah, so this slide, or this equation on slide 63 is important because it relates the adhesive surface tension to the regular surface tension. Now what's important to realize, right, is they can simply give you the contact angle and you should be able to identify which one of these adhesion or cohesion is stronger, right? So let's say, theta C is greater than 90. So let's say our contact angle is greater than 90. Like they just give you this diagram. Well, cosine of an angle greater than 90 is going to be a negative number um, because it's in the left quadrant. So cosine of like 100, if you plug it into your calculator, it's going to give you a negative number. What that means is we're doing one plus a negative number, meaning this term is going to be like 0 0.6 or something. It's going to be a decimal between zero and one. While our adhesive surface tension is related to our regular surface tension multiplied by that constant. So what this ineffectively is saying is if our contact angle is greater than 90, then our adhesive surface tension is going to be less than our cohesive surface tension. So again, theta C greater than 90 degrees, I'll just write, it also has to be less than 180 degrees because it'll always be between zero and 180. So let me write that out, sorry. So if our theta C is between 90 and 180, then we know cohesive is stronger than adhesive. So there's no subscript for cohesive surface tension, we just use the regular lambda, but cohesive is greater than adhesive. Now let's look at the example where theta C, sorry, so zero is less than theta C is less than 90 degrees. So anywhere between zero and 90 degrees, note that cosine of theta C will then be a positive number and so one plus a positive number yields a number bigger than one. And so our lambda A is going to be equal to like 1.2 times lambda, which means now what's happening is our adhesive surface forces are stronger. So if 
theta c is between 0 and 90, adhesive forces are going to dominate. And note that this can easily be phrased as a multiple choice question. They just give you a diagram and they ask you to identify which one is stronger than the other or whether it's not possible to determine. So you have to use this equation um, for your reasoning for that. Um, this one, really easy, quick check, right? Cohesion, remember, similar molecules binding together. Here, this is water molecules to a mirror, no. Water molecules to a pine needle, no. Water molecules to blood vessels, no. Water molecules to one another, yes, right? Water molecules to water molecules. Same things binding together, that's going to be cohesion. Um, again, quick summary, right? Co contact angle only depends on adhesive surface tension and cohesive surface tension based on this equation, right? The equation that we just talked about. Um, and so depending on which one of those forces takes dominance over the other, that tells us what our contact angle is going to be. You don't need to know the, how the, um, what's this called? How, how it came about or the background on this. You just need to know the equation. Um, this is, again, um, I don't know what equation they had on this slide. For the ministry's radius size, it's the same thing. If the radius, the cross section okay. radius divided by the radius of curvature, you put a cosine of the contact angle. Yeah, so again, all of these formulas are on your formula sheet, but th this diagram, if they ask a question relating to it, they'll give you this diagram on the exam. Um, but again, R, just remember, is the radius of the tube. RC is the radius of curvature of our actual sphere, or, or of our bubble. Um, like Mustafa was saying earlier, this theta C is this contact angle, but note due to geometry and trigonometry, it's also related to this angle between R and RC there. Um, so, so yeah, um, that's that's that equation. Um, and then, as well as rho GH yeah. is equal to Q times the surface tension divided by the radius of curvature. Okay, so this one, um, I'm trying to think how this one works. Do you know how to explain this one, or? Yeah, so for capillary action, I mean, this was the example that we had in, I think, either one of the homework review sessions or um, quiz review, I can't remember exactly, but basically, for your hydrostatic pressure difference, um, I think what it was is, this also kind of relates back to the Laplace equation. So if you have that P in is equal to P out. And that's plus two times surface tension of the curvature. I think what they had it was, um, they refer to one of them with gauge pressure. So one of them cancels out and the other one is just equal to rho GH based on like the hydrostatic pressure equation. So I can't remember if it was P in or P out, but um, I think usually what they had is that P out was the atmospheric pressure. Yeah. And so that, that gauge pressure for that was zero. So P in was rho GH, and that's just equal to your adhesive surface tension, or yeah, no, your cohesive surface tension times two divided by your radius of curvature. So this was just looking at um, that Laplace equation, but then looking at one of the pressures specifically being atmospheric pressure. And so the gauge pressure for atmospheric pressure is just zero. And so then they're just looking at the gauge pressure for the inside of like the bubble, right? Or inside of the fluid. And then that's just equal to two times the um, cohesive surface tension divided by the radius of curvature. Yeah. And the only time I've seen this equation is they just ask you to identify how high a fluid will rise and they'll give you all the other. Yeah, areas. exactly. So. so you can just use like, if you have your surface tension your radius of curvature, you can use that um, to figure out the height of the water, for example. Yep, and then again, another pretty simple quick check. Which one, where is cohesive greater than adhesive? Remember, cohesive is um, bonding to itself, so molecules bonding to each other. Adhesive is to the surface, to external surfaces. So here, for instance, if we look at water, right, in the middle, it's smaller, but at the peaks, it's higher. That means the water molecules are sticking to the tube surface, and that's why they're being dragged along that's why as we go further and further, it's going to keep looking like that kind of meniscus. So in this example in water, the adhesive surface, adhesive forces are dominating. Note you can that, also, yeah. my bad, you can also kind of think about it as like, for these, for the, um, for the adhesive surface tension, you can see that the water is kind of moving away from the center of all the other water molecules and towards the edge yeah. and attaching to the tube. While here for the mercury, they're all kind of moving away from the tube, from the edges towards the center, kind of forming that concave shape. Exactly, yeah. So if everything similar is bundling together, then it's going to be cohesive forces. 
And so here our answer is going to be to the Mercury tube system. Um, and then, yeah, this, was the yeah, example of that. this is like the example with the rho gh is equal to 2 lambda over rc. So I think last example for today, yep. So um, they don't tell us the density of water, but we should, or they do tell us. So it's going to be 1,000 um, times g, which is 10, times h, which is what we're trying to find, is equal to 2 times the surface tension, which is 70 millinewtons per meters. Don't forget, convert that to SI units. So that's newtons over meters. Um, divided by the radius of curvature, again, they tell us the R value is 0.5 millimeters. So R, if R is 0.5 millimeters, which is uh, 0.5 times 10 to the negative 3 meters, and they also tell us the contact angle. Contact angle is zero. Zero degrees, awesome. So that actually makes things really simple because wh what is one of our equations? It's R over RC is equal to cosine of theta C. Well, if theta c is 0, cosine of 0 is 1. So what does that mean? r over rc is equal to 1. r equals rc. If r equals rc, and we're told r is 0 0.5 times 10 to the negative 3, then we know rc is also 0 0.5 times 10 to the negative 3 meters. And so we plug that into our denominator right here. Um, and so we divide that by rc to get 0 0.5 times 10 to the negative 3 meters. We plug this all into our calculator, solve for h, and we should get <laughs> no, uh, they don't tell us? No, no. Okay. But yeah. yeah. Whatever you get. But the idea here, I think, is the most important thing is that your radius here, whenever they say radius, they're just talking about that cross-sectional radius from here to here, right? From the edge of the tube to the center. If they say radius of curvature, then that's that RC. So don't make that mistake because if they just say radius, it's just a cross-sectional radius from the edge of the tube to the center there. Um, but if they're talking about the radius of curvature, then they will denote that, and that's your RC. So if they give you that radius of 0.5, then that's not your radius of curvature. You have to plug that into the R over RC equation. That way, with a contact angle, you'd be able to figure out your radius of curvature. From the radius of curvature, you can plug it into this equation. That's the derivation of um, Laplace's equation. And then from that, you'd be able to figure out what your height is. So in that case, that equation, the rho gh equals 2 times the surface tension divided by the radius of curvature. You can use that equation. And usually, it's just simply just to figure out how high the water will rise in that situation. So that's pretty much it, I think, for yeah, so this week 13 stuff. Yep, right? that'll be it for week 13. Um, again, weeks 14 and 15, Friday, 12 to 3, and then the fishbowl will be open next yep. Wednesday all day. Um, and then everything, all these resources are on Google Drive. In the exam folder posted um, on the YouTube channel and in the group means as well. And then all the professors have sent out an email yep. with this information too. So um, I think that's about it. So thank you for those who are watching online.